Every year, millions of us flock to the Mediterranean. The sun, sea and sand making it a perfect place to relax. But the Med is also the birthplace of many great civilizations whose survival depended on the geological forces around them. For thousands of years, civilizations have been locked in a never-ending war in which countless battles have claimed many lives and victories have only been won through great skill and ingenuity. But I'm not talking about battles with fellow humans. I'm talking about the fight against a much trickier opponent, water. Because water is so crucial to us, the really successful civilizations are the ones who have learned to best exploit it. Through the ages, civilizations have had to rise to the challenges presented by water. I'm going to travel to Turkey to discover whether its Stone Age inhabitants survived one of the biggest floods in human history. To Greece, where a simple rock solves the mystery of a stranded civilization. And I'll reveal how water helped bring the greatest empire of the ancient world to its knees. As a geologist, I'll tell you a story of the Mediterranean that you won't hear from the tour guides. I'll show you that whether we control water or water controls us, it's all down to what's beneath our feet, the rocks. Around 8,000 years ago, water brought catastrophe to this area of Turkey. And I'm going to discover whether the Stone Age people who lived here managed to survive it. This is Kilios Beach on the Black Sea coast of Turkey. It's about an hour's drive north of Istanbul and it's the favourite summer getaway for those escaping the city heat. The evidence that a disaster of biblical proportions took place here lies deep down in the murky depths. 150 metres below sea level, there are remains of what was once an ancient coastline. But what's a coastline doing down there? Well, you don't have to be a geologist to realise that sea level was once much lower than it is today. You see, at the end of the last ice age, this thousand kilometre long Black Sea was nothing more than just an isolated lake. Around its shorelines, were the settlements and hunting grounds of our Stone Age ancestors. So what happened to the people who lived here? Well, to find out, we have to turn to a massive, mind-boggling natural machine, the water cycle. Over a period of 3,000 years, a volume of water equivalent to all the oceans falls on our planet. The movement of this water around the globe is known as the water cycle. Water evaporates from the oceans and passes into the atmosphere. It makes its way back down when it falls as rain or snow. Huge quantities of water fall at the North and South Poles, adding to the ice already there. The polar ice sheets grow, taking up more and more water. So as the ice builds up, sea levels go down. But when temperatures begin to rise, the opposite happens. Melted water from the ice runs down into the oceans and the water levels begin to rise. That's exactly what was happening 10,000 years ago and eventually gave us the Mediterranean coastline we know today. The Med stretches from the Straits of Gibraltar in the west, across Spain, Greece and Turkey, to the shores of Israel in the Middle East. To the north is mainland Europe, 
and to the south, the continent of Africa. And just to the northeast of the Mediterranean is the Black Sea. It's when the waters rose to create this coastline that disaster struck what is now northern Turkey. I'm going to use this local food to show you what I mean. Here is the Mediterranean. This is the Middle East. Here is North Africa. That is the Straits of Gibraltar. And here is Europe. Now, the Med was gradually expanding as the rising oceans fed more and more water into it. It rose about 120 metres, over 400 feet. Now, over here, to the northeast of the Med, was a freshwater lake. Now, at first, the people who lived around the shores of the lake wouldn't have been too concerned by the rising Mediterranean waters. That's because the sea was safely held back by a land bridge, which acted like a giant dam. And the land bridge crossed from where Istanbul and Bosphorus are today. But the sea could only be held back for so long. Inevitably, about 8,000 years ago, the water spilled over the land bridge. The whole area was engulfed by the salty Mediterranean waters and the original shoreline was drowned. By 6,000 years ago, the small freshwater lake had become the Black Sea that we know today. All this flooding was pretty bad news for those who lived along the old lake shore. This was one of the biggest natural disasters in human history. Did the Stone Age people who lived here manage to survive? The evidence suggests that many of them did. They even journeyed across Europe and as far away as Asia. The clues can be found in our language. Some linguists believe that many modern languages throughout Europe and Western Asia are related and can be traced back to those Stone Age travellers. Take the word father, for example. Do you know the word for father in Turkish? Father. Baba. 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 Ah, is that the only word you have, Baba? Pedar. Oh, what was that? Pedar. 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 I want to know the word for father in Portuguese. Pai. 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 In English, father. In French? Père. Père. Papa. Papa. And what is your language in Hindi? Hindi. Hindi. In Hindi, it's Papa. 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 The Spanish for father. Mi padre. Spanish for what? The word father. Padre is padre, no? Padre. 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 Of course, padre. OK, so in European languages, we've got uh, padre, we've got patera, We've got Vata, we've got Per. In Turkish, we've got Baba or Pedara. And in Asian languages, it's the same too. In Sanskrit, we've got Pitar, in Hindi, we've got Papa. And the reason is, all of these words originated from the same source. And it looks like the source of those words was right here, the Black Sea. 8,000 years ago, when the inhabitants fled their homelands to escape the Great Flood, they took their language with them. However fast the flooding of the Black Sea may have been, it seems that there were many who managed to get away in time. As the planet warmed up and sea levels rose, not everyone was able to escape the rising oceans by land. Some people were stranded, surrounded by water. Taking a cruise on the Aegean Sea it's a popular way for holidaymakers to travel around the Greek islands and absorb the sights. The 
tourists who flock to Greece every year have over a thousand islands to choose from. But many of these islands wouldn't be here at all if it hadn't been for those rising waters. If you'd have been here 10,000 years ago, you'd have been hiking. That's because these apparently far-flung islands were a collection of larger land masses. The area of the Aegean stretched between what is now mainland Greece and the west coast of Turkey. People lived and farmed here. But as the Mediterranean waters rose, the area started to flood. People were forced to move to higher land. What were once peaks on a large landmass were transformed into islands. Our Stone Age ancestors gradually became marooned on their islands. To make matters worse, many found themselves with limited resources. This isolation could spell disaster, if not total extinction. The only way for the islanders to survive was to take to the seas. The mystery of whether they managed to achieve this can be solved by geology. A major clue is this rock. It's called obsidian and it's from this island, Milos, in the Aegean. Obsidian is a clue because it has a special quality which is all down to how it formed in the first place. To find out how it got here, I'm going to travel back 15 million years. Fifteen million years ago, just as now, the whole of the Earth's surface was a series of moving plates. In this region, the African plate was moving north towards the European plate. Now, imagine that that strip of rock over there is the African plate, and imagine that one over there is the European one. Well, stuck in the middle was the Tethys Ocean, destined to become the Mediterranean. The African plate was moving really fast, roughly at the rate that my fingernails grow. Now, you may think that's slow, but in geological time, that is motoring along. As the plates collided, the African one was pushed deep down beneath the European one, dragging part of the Tethys Ocean floor behind it. As it descended, wet rocks were taken down into the depths. Over a few million years, water in the rocks were carried to deeper, hotter parts of the Earth's interior until heat and pressure forced the rock to melt. This melted rock, or magma, was pushed upwards through faults in the crust of the overlying European plate to become volcanoes. That's how the volcanic island of Milos was formed five million years ago. The same process also created the massive deposits of obsidian here. It's what the islanders did with this rock that solves the mystery of whether they managed to set to sea. You can still find obsidian on Milos. In fact, here, it's absolutely everywhere. All of these black pebbles are obsidian. But what I want to find is the actual rock that fragments like this came from. And here it is. This is an ancient lava flow, 
and it's stuffed full of obsidian. Look, there's a big lump here. Here's a little piece. There's absolutely loads of it. Obsidian is like a volcanic glass, which is formed when molten lava like this once was cools really quickly. So quickly, in fact, that crystals don't have time to form. Because it's got no real crystals, it doesn't have a regular structure, and that means it's easy to cut into smooth, sharp edges. This characteristic of obsidian made it ideal as a versatile tool. Stone Age implements made from obsidian have been found at archaeological sites across the Aegean and on mainland Greece. Our late Stone Age ancestors used obsidian for arrowheads and knives, as well as for carving wood and bone tools. It was also good for digging, and that made it really useful for farmers. Obsidian also helps in our quest to find out what happened to the people stuck on their islands. It's a very revealing rock. It has a unique geological fingerprint, so it's easy to trace where it came from. All the Stone Age obsidian tools found around the Aegean have been traced back to Milos. Obsidian was one of the most sought-after items in the ancient world and provides the earliest evidence of transport of goods by sea. Thanks to obsidian and some clever geological detective work, we now know that our Stone Age ancestors were able to move off their islands. They not only survived, but traded and thrived. Travel by sea in the Mediterranean had begun in earnest. As the Stone Age passed into the Bronze Age, the need to travel further across the seas continued to challenge those living in the region. And a new Mediterranean civilization was about to rise to this challenge, leaving us with a navigational mystery. story begins in Egypt, where a Greek-speaking people from Crete, called the Minoans, have given us a puzzle to solve. Wall paintings in tombs at Thebes show Minoan figures and their wares. What's more, fragments of paintings created by the Minoans themselves have also been found in Egypt, suggesting they actually settled and lived here. Egypt is nearly 1,000 kilometres from the Minoans' home in Crete. So how did they manage to get here? In 1500 BC, successfully navigating the Mediterranean across open water would have been a monumental and hazardous journey. The answer lies in the Minoans' skillful use of the wind. The Minoans realised that they could use the wind for more than just powering their sails. They could also use it for navigation. It was their understanding of how the Aegean winds worked that enabled them to set sail across open waters and head directly for Egypt with no visual points of reference. The winds from the Aegean to Egypt are mainly northwesterlies. In other words, in order to get to Egypt, all the Minoans had to do was follow the winds and they would take them to the southeast. By using their knowledge of the winds to navigate, the Minoans had kick-started a new era in sea travel. By 1000 BC, a new seafaring civilization had managed to go one better, and I'm going to show you what they came up with. The Phoenicians were originally from Lebanon, and they travelled further than any of their predecessors, 
using a revolutionary method of navigation. The Phoenicians steered by the stars in the sky, especially the pole star, the only one that hardly ever changes its position. And that's because the Earth's axis of rotation points almost exactly towards it. Using the stars to navigate, the Phoenicians were the first to trace routes to the Western Mediterranean and towards the Atlantic coasts of Africa and Europe. Their navigational skills helped the Phoenicians control trade and as a consequence, they became one of the major players in the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Just like the Phoenicians, the Greeks who followed were also determined to master the Med and create a trading empire they introduced another heavenly body as a navigational tool. During the day, of course, there weren't any convenient stars to use. But by 330 BC, the Greeks had started to navigate using the sun. And this is how they did it. If I stand a straw on its end, it casts a shadow. Now, the length of the shadow that it casts at midday gives me my latitude. In other words, how far north or south of the equator I am. Now, if I go towards the equator, the length of the shadows gets less because the sun is directly overhead. But if I go northwards away from the equator, the length of the shadow gets bigger because the sun is lower in the sky. This was a principle that the early sailors used to estimate their latitude. Of course, they probably didn't use straws. Eventually, instruments were developed that gave much more precise measurements but which still relied on the sun's shadow. Impressively simple, but navigating by the sun and the stars had one major drawback. The weather. In winter, the Mediterranean can be just as bad as in Scotland. It's cold, wet, but more importantly, grey. Now, if you've got clouds and you can't see the sky, then you can't see the sun and the stars. In other words, you can't navigate. And if you can't navigate, you can't trade. The solution lay deep down in the centre of the Earth. If you imagine that this peach is the Earth, then the skin it's the crust. I'm sitting on it here. Now, if I dig down a few tens of kilometres or, or miles, then I get to the mantle, which is this orange stuff here. And if I dig even deeper, then I get down to the core, the peach stone. Now, the thing about the core is that the outer part is a fluid mixture of sulphur and iron. And this iron-rich fluid is sloshing around with the rotation of the earth. Because the iron is moving, it creates electric current. This circulating current generates a magnetic field that is lined up north-south within the Earth, just like a giant bar magnet. The magnetic fields pop out of the south of the planet, travel all the way around and pop back in in the north of the planet. It was thanks to these magnetic fields that a new instrument was developed, which gave mariners an even greater command of the seas. The compass. And to make a compass, you needed a very special rock. Remember the collision between the African plate and the European one that caused the crust to crumple? Well. That exposed this stuff at the surface, magnetite. Magnetite is a mineral containing iron oxide, which naturally aligns itself north-south with the Earth's magnetic field. By the 12th century, the idea of the magnetic compass had been brought to Europe by Arab traders, probably from China. But these early compasses were very primitive. Let me show you. Sailors would rub an iron needle against a lump of magnetite, to magnetise it. Then they'd float it in a bowl of water and the needle would align itself north-south. 
Even though the compass wasn't entirely accurate, for early sailors, not even the rough position of north was a big deal in letting them explore. Having been flooded and stranded by the rising Mediterranean, over thousands of years, sailors had developed increasingly sophisticated navigational skills and introduced instruments like the compass. They had finally learned to master the challenge of the seas. Water also presented our ancestors with challenges on land. To meet these, they first had to understand nature's remarkable plumbing system. It would take all the ingenuity of the ancient Greeks to figure it out. It's here in the Peloponnese region of mainland Greece that the ancients used their knowledge of geology to save the land from flooding and defeat their enemies. Here, the summers are long and hot and rain tends to appear only in the winter. For the ancient Greeks, survival depended on freshwater springs like these. The springs were their lifeblood, providing water all year round, even in the dry summer months. The source of these springs lies many kilometres away, up in the mountains, where geology provided the Greeks with its very own water storage and plumbing system. Here at Capsia, in a labyrinth of caves and tunnels, we can see how it all works thanks to a very useful rock. Wow! Look at these wonderful cave rocks. Look, we've got, uh, we've got our stalactites and stalagmites. Remember, tights come down, mites go up. We've got these curtains of rock along the back here. We've got these sheets, which are called flowstone. And all of this is just from water that's percolating through, carrying dissolved limestone. And then when it comes out into the cave, it deposits it. These are unbelievable. These rocks are made from limestone. Around 100 million years ago, this limestone was actually the ocean bed. It's made from the body parts of billions of tiny, spineless sea creatures, squashed and compacted together. The collision of Africa into Europe squeezed these rocks up out of the ocean. As a result, most of the Mediterranean Sea is now surrounded by limestone, which has proved to be a bit of a lifesaver. Over a cup of coffee and a slice of cake, I'm going to show you how this natural water storage system works. Because it's porous, Limestone is able to capture water falling as rain. Imagine a sponge cake as a layer of porous limestone. When it rains, I'm going to use coffee, the rain permeates into the limestone. Gravity drags it down through the rock until it hits an impermeable, non-porous layer beneath, in this case, the plate. The limestone rocks act as a natural storage system, absorbing and then releasing the rainwater over a long period of time. Eventually, this water emerges many miles away as freshwater springs. The ancient Greeks were about to uncover the route the water took from the limestone hills to the distant springs. And this knowledge would eventually save them from a watery disaster. The clue to discovering how the water travelled from the hills to the springs lay on the plains. Here, the Greeks found a series of holes in the ground, known as sinkholes. They're formed by rainwater flowing over limestone rock. When the water finds a crack in the rock, it starts to slowly dissolve it. Over time, 
more and more of the limestone is eaten away and the crack gets bigger and bigger, eventually creating a sinkhole like this. The Greeks wanted to know where these sinkholes led, so they devised a simple but brilliant experiment. To find out where the waters of a particular sinkhole went, the ancient Greeks used these pine cones. Down below me is where that pine cone would have come out if I'd had the patience to wait for a few weeks. The sinkholes that I've just been to at Capsia are about 25 miles, 40 kilometres over in that direction. The water in those sinkholes has flowed down through underground channels that have carried them below the limestone mountain and out into these freshwater springs at Caveri on the shores of the Gulf of Argos. The pine cone experiment had shown the ancient Greeks the route the water took from the limestone mountains to the springs at the coast. Now they had a basic geological understanding of the underground water network. And this newfound knowledge was about to come to their rescue. The climate of the Mediterranean has changed little since ancient times. Through the long, hot summer months, the Mediterranean is dry and parched. When after months of drought, the weather finally changes, the rain is a godsend, replenishing both the land and the springs. But in ancient Greece, the rain could also bring destruction. When winter storms threatened to flood the plains where they lived and farmed, the Greeks used the sinkholes to avert disaster. To get rid of that flood water, they built drainage channels like this, down to the sinkhole, and walking in a giant gutter. By diverting the flood water to the sinkholes, it drained safely away to distant springs. For the people of the plain, sinkholes were a gift from geology. Unfortunately, they could also be a gift to their enemies. This is all that remains of the ancient Greek city of Mantinea. 125 kilometres west of Athens. In 418 BC, this was the site of the largest land battle of the Peloponnesian Wars. The Mantineans, with their allies, were fighting their neighbours, the Spartans. And I'm about to show you an action replay. And here it is. Well, in miniature at least. Here's the city of Mantinea, and here, up on the hills, are the Mantineans and their allies. Down on the plain are the Spartans, 4,000 men led by their king, Agis. Agis and his Spartan army advance till they're within a javelin's throw of the Mantineans. But the Mantineans have got the advantage of height up on those hills. Things aren't looking good for the Spartans. Suddenly, Agis orders his army to withdraw. He has come up with a cunning plan. He's going to use geology to win the battle. Now, there are several major sinkholes on the Mantinean plain, and the wily king Agis 
knew that these were crucial to the maintenance because it provided drainage during heavy rainfall. Aeus realised that the autumn rains were imminent, so he decided to block the downstream end of this river. That would cause the river to flood over the landlocked plains, and the sinkholes just wouldn't be able to cope with the huge amounts of water. The blocked river flowed onto the plain. Together with the impending autumn rains, the volume of water would be too much for the sinkholes, and they'd overflow. The Mantineans couldn't just stay up in the hills and watch their city and farmland flood. So they came down to the plain and lost their height advantage. It was just what Aeus wanted, and he moved in for the attack. King Aeus's tactics worked brilliantly. I'll spare you the details of the battle that followed. Suffice to say, the Mantineans were defeated. The ancient Greeks had used their knowledge of geology to control water and even conquer their enemies on the battlefield. Back in the cities, water management was also a major issue. Citizens were demanding water for both sanitation and recreation, and the Greeks responded with their trademark ingenuity. Established in 700 BC, Corinth was a major Greek city-state, which gained much of its power from its commanding position. It ruled two gulfs, two ports, and the land bridge linking Athens to the Peloponnese. But the jewel in its crown was water. Ancient Corinth wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for an abundance of natural springs. In Greek times, it was known as the well-watered city, and it was something like 20 springs. The biggest and most important was here, the Perini Spring. Its position determined the location of the baths, the Agora or marketplace, even the houses of the elite. The rain that falls on the slopes above trickles down through these limestone pebbles until it meets rock that it can't get through. The water then flows down along the rock until it gets to the spring. Not satisfied with the capacity of the natural water channels, the Greeks carved out much larger ones, like this. They put in a whole new plumbing system. Later, when the Romans arrived in 146 BC, they took Greek plumbing to new heights. This was a Roman fountain house. Fresh spring water would have been constantly spouting out of these holes. Corinthians would collect the water in their amphora, or jugs, and take it away for drinking. The uncollected water would flow away in these channels down to the street. The spring water would have flowed along the edge of the main street at ancient Corinth. Here, there would have been a line of shops, and shoppers would have bent down, dabbed their sweaty brow, and had a little drink. These weren't sewers or drains. They were over here below the main road. They were about this size. This was plumbing at its most sophisticated. And what was flowing through the drains? Well, that was over here. Welcome to the toilets at ancient Corinth. The Romans would have sat around here chatting to their friends and doing their business through the holes below. When they finished, they would wash their hands in the water flowing along this channel and their business be flushed out along here. Convenient and very public. Knowing that their wealth and power depended on it, water inspired the Romans to innovate. 
pushing them to new technological heights. The more technologically advanced and sophisticated civilizations became, the more they battled to control water. Often, they battled in vain, and the ingenious Romans were no exception. The Romans were ambitious. They knew if they mastered the Mediterranean trade routes, they would secure the dominance of their empire. The key to their strategy was to take possession of major seaports. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, the most important seaport of all was Ephesus. In 133 BC, the Romans took control of Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey. But within 600 years, Ephesus had become a ghost town. In its heyday, Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, and a quarter of a million people lived here. It was a thriving port, bustling with life. But after centuries of commercial and cultural dominance, Ephesus was abandoned. So what happened to this magnificent city? And ladies and gentlemen, right here, you all can see three arches... Today, as one of Turkey's most popular attractions, the only people you'll find in Ephesus are tourists. I'm going to find out how much they've learned. Here, at this spot, we can see two different buildings together. Why did the Romans leave this, this beautiful city? You haven't told us that. Oh. <laughs> Why did the Romans leave this city? Oh, but he's a guide. He knows. We haven't got round to that yet. We the guide knows. Yeah, we haven't got round to that yet. All right. <laughs> We're trying to find out why this city became abandoned. Because yeah. of the mosquitoes. I don't have a clue. You don't have a clue? <laughs> I'm no. very sorry. The river still, still did, yeah. Right. So it was no longer a harbour. Why did the Romans leave? I have no idea. You no know, idea? They had a lot of problems with the river meander. Right. Salting up the harbour. Because of malaria. Because of malaria. It's just too, got hot. too hot. It's too hot. <laughs> It got you know, what's the shopping? Yeah. What's there done with the shopping? The shop Cleopatra shop. came a couple of times and she went shopping. The shops are lousy, aren't they? They're yeah, they're lousy. And the bathroom, you know, what are you going to do? And the yeah. bathroom smell, you, know, you just get tired of things. I think you you're absolutely on. right. I think you've just <laughs> you know? started a new theory. Well, it used to be a port, didn't it? And uh, the sea dried up and maybe that's what it was. Well, it looks like some people have been paying attention. The reason for the fall of Ephesus lies in the silting up of the harbour. This is the road leading to the ancient harbour at Ephesus, its gateway to the rest of the world. Every day, huge amounts of vital goods would come down this way to the harbour, out to sea, bound for Rome and the Empire. Does anyone speak English? I'm looking, no, no. I'm no. looking for the sea. No. Is this a road to the sea? The sea? Turkey. Only Turkish. No, see, the sea. Uh, the Denise. The Denise. This way. This way. Get how far? Far? Yes. This way. Just, just here. Okay. I've been walking for half an hour now, and still no sign of the sea. I should have reached the harbour ages ago. Instead, all I've seen are fields and this. Swamp. The 
this is where the harbour should be, but there's no port. No coastline. Just acres of marshy swampland. The story of what happened to the harbour all started with a change in the weather. Around the time the Romans arrived in Ephesus, the planet was undergoing climate change. The Mediterranean area was becoming warmer and wetter. Ephesus had fertile river valleys, which were ideal for farming. And coupled with its easy access to the sea, Ephesus soon became a breadbasket for Rome. But as the Roman Empire grew, so did its appetite. More farmland was needed. Seizing their chance to improve on what nature had given them, the Romans cleared massive areas of forest to make way for more crops. This was a huge mistake and was going to cut off Ephesus from the sea forever. To understand why, I need to go to the mountains. This is where I've come into the mountains to find. The source of the Kuchuk Menderes River, known to the Romans as the Keister River, which flows 95 kilometres in that direction, all the way down to Ephesus. These mountains were among those formed 50 million years ago when Africa collided into Europe and pushed up the floor of the ocean. As the ground rose, this river, which once meandered gently down to the sea, was raised higher above sea level. The higher a river is above sea level, the more power it has, and this one became a raging torrent. But it wasn't going to stay that way forever. By around 6,000 years ago, thanks to melting ice sheets, the Mediterranean Sea rose by 120 metres. That's nearly 400 feet. That meant that rivers weren't as high above sea level as before. As a result, they lost some of their energy. They slowed down. And it was this slowing down of the rivers that was to ultimately prove disastrous for the Ephesians. By cutting down trees, the Romans had meddled with nature. The trees had performed the vital function of binding the soil together. With the increased rainfall no longer broken by the forest, water hit exposed ground and took the fertile topsoil with it. Now the weakened rivers were simply not powerful enough to carry all this extra eroded soil and rock out to sea, so they dumped them at their mouths. For this river, the Keister, its mouth was exactly where Ephesus was. As more and more sediment built up, the city was cut off from the sea. It was a disaster. <laughs> The same problem was hitting other parts of the Roman Empire too. As its arteries became clogged up, the empire was brought to the brink of a major heart attack. Marshy sheltered lagoons like this covered large areas of the Mediterranean coastline. For many ancient cities, these lagoons were the lifeblood. They were teeming with fish. But as the rivers dumped sediment at the coast, the lagoons turned to muddy swamps and the fish disappeared. Navigating these congested rivers also became a major problem. The forces of geology were unrelenting. To give you an idea of how unrelenting, I've climbed to the highest point of the theatre at Ephesus. 
The harbour is at the end of that ancient road that we walked down. But the harbour itself has been completely filled in by river sediments. All that's left is a couple of patches of shimmering water. The sea is 11 kilometres, about 8 miles over there, just visible on the horizon. This clogging up by river deposits turned what was a port into an inland mothballed city. By isolating them from the sea, geology hadn't been very kind to the inhabitants of Ephesus, but unfortunately, that was only the half of it. In ancient times, this was one of the wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. Today it lies ruined, submerged in a water-filled swamp. These swamps provided the perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes, which brought deadly malaria. Plagued by disease, the people of Ephesus either died or fled. And Ephesus wasn't alone. As other cities suffered the same fate, the very ships that had once ferried goods and ideas around the Mediterranean now began to spread malaria throughout the Roman Empire. In the end, the Romans could no longer keep hold of the land. All around the Mediterranean world, their harbours and ports were abandoned behind advancing coasts. Now I know that the fall of the Roman Empire can be put down to many things, but as a geologist, I reckon that rivers causing the silting up of harbours and the resultant deadly malaria must have had a huge impact. For the Roman Empire, water played a crucial role in both its rise and fall. Water had brought it prosperity. It had created fertile river valleys and bustling ports. But fueled by their desire to expand, the Romans upset the balance of nature and unwittingly unleashed the destructive power of water. And today, centuries after the fall of Ephesus, mismanagement is still causing problems on our coastlines. Just as coastal areas get clogged up by rivers dumping their deposits, so the exact opposite also takes place, which brings us here to the Costa del Sol. The Millions of tourists flock here every year. But I'm not here for the sun, I'm here for the geology. The beaches, which are the main attraction, are under threat. When we come here on holiday, we expect to find acres of this stuff. Sand. But something has happened to the sand all along this coastline. Things are not as they seem. This natural beach here completely disappeared. Exposing all these rocks, 
the sand that we now see was dredged up from way offshore and dumped. This beach and many other like it along the coast are completely man-made. The problem is that the demands of the tourist industry are destroying the very coastline people come here to enjoy. And it all starts inland. Up in the hills, dams have been built, which are great for providing electricity and water, but they also reduce the power of rivers. Rivers carry eroded rock or sediment from the mountains down to the coast. When they reach the shoreline, they deposit the sediment, creating beautiful, natural sandy beaches. But when dams and reservoirs reduce the flow of these rivers, less sediment is carried downstream. And when the sediment does eventually reach the coast, there's often another man-made obstacle in its way. Down here at the coast, promenades like this act as barriers that make it much more difficult for the rivers to deliver the sand to the sea. What little sand does make it to the beach is then exposed to a natural process called longshore drift. This is how longshore drift works. The ocean currents here are kind of moving westwards. That's that direction there. So what happens is that they bring the waves in at a high angle to the coast. Let me show you. The waves bring the water in at an angle to the beach. Say something like that. And then as the water goes back out, it goes back down here, taking sand grains with it. The next wave takes the water back in. Ah, yeah! Look what it's done. All right, next wave brings it back in. The sand grains trickle back down. The next one brings it back in, and it trickles down. Back in, trickles down. Back in, trickles down. And that is how your average sand grain moves along the beach. Longshore drift takes sand from up there and carries it down here, creating and replenishing beaches. But what happens when humans intervene to upset that process? Smart new marinas like this are an essential part of every fashionable resort. And while they may seem like a natural addition to the coastline, they're actually very bad news for beaches. Marinas act as barriers, disrupting the process of longshore drift. By stopping sand moving along the shore, beaches further down the Costa del Sol are gradually disappearing. Coastal environments are very delicately balanced, and we meddle with them at our peril. Water is an immense and unpredictable force. It can be destructive, but it can also inspire. All around the Mediterranean, the influence of water has shaped history. The rising seas around Turkey started one of the first waves of human migration. Our Stone Age ancestors journeyed far from their homelands. Their cultural influence has helped shape many of the languages we speak today. As the water continued to rise, Successive civilizations looked for new ways to navigate the high seas. Geology provided solutions. The arrival of the compass brought great power and wealth as new trade routes were opened all across the Mediterranean. On land, geology led the ancient Greeks to a greater understanding of how water could be controlled. The ingenious Romans developed their own technology to manipulate water. Though ultimately, it was water itself that helped seal their downfall. But what of the future? Will it be as dramatic as the past? Deep down beneath the ocean, even more powerful forces are at work. 
forces that will eventually destroy the Mediterranean. Three great plates, Arabia, Africa and Europe, are being pushed together, squashing the land masses of the Med in an enormous vice. Eventually, North Africa will crush into Southern Europe. The Mediterranean will literally squeeze shut. In 30 million years, the Mediterranean Sea will be pushed up into the Mediterranean mountains. Someday, people will be skiing here, and I don't mean water skiing. For further information on Open University programs, please go to open2.net.